Welcome back, everyone, to the Dark Parade. I am your host, Bo Ransdell, uh, here to welcome you to the beginning of a new season or series of movies. Not really a season. We don't do that around here. Um, but we are doing uh, a series of movies, and it's confession time for yours truly. I, uh, up until doing this series, had never seen a movie by the title of Black Christmas. Not the original, not the remake, not the second remake, none of them. And one of the things I really enjoy about doing this show is sometimes it forces me to watch movies that I've always meant to watch or, or intended to watch or had been recommended to me or whatever. And that's where this uh, series of movies really came from is I wanted to go back and watch the original Black Christmas, and it is the season, after all. Here we are uh, in the the thrust of the Christmas holiday. And so I wanted to do something that was a little Christmassy and didn't want to do, like, Silent Night, Deadly Night, and all those terrible movies. Uh, and I haven't seen a lot of those, so I'm speaking largely out of my rectum when I say that they're terrible. But <laughs> I... I wanted to go back and and sort of plug in the gaps in some of my horror viewing. And so that leads to tonight's show, which is myself and Court Psyops, who, uh, you know, one, one of those guests that I knew was going to happen at some point. I'm glad it happened here uh, because as we were talking about Black Christmas, we just had an absolute blast with it. Um, so yeah, I think you're going to enjoy it. If you've never seen Black Christmas, of course, we spoil this uh, to no end. So uh, I would recommend watching the movie. Both of us definitely recommend the movie. Watch the movie before you listen to this show. Uh, if you care about spoilers at all, there you have been sufficiently warned. I don't want to hear any crap from you people. So with that said, um, I, I just want to say uh, it's it's been a great start uh, for this podcast. I really appreciate um, everyone who has been turning out, both for the Sinister Sundays on Sunday nights over on YouTube, that happens at 5 o'clock Central, most Sundays, unless scheduling uh, disallows uh, that particular show, but we've been having a great time there. I've been really enjoying the conversations happening in the Facebook group. I really enjoy the feedback that I've been getting, so uh, I just wanted to wish you all a happy holidays and to thank you very much from truly the bottom of my heart for coming along on this podcast. We're only a couple of months old, and uh, we've just been having a great time. I really love doing this. It, it feels like the thing that I've always wanted to do, and now that I'm doing it, uh, I, I'm just a, as pleased as punch, as we say here in the South when we're terribly old. Um, okay, without further ado, uh, like I said, it, the spoilers will abound. Please do not listen to this. If you have not watched Black Christmas, go do that first it's a terrific movie then come back and listen to this but if you have seen black christmas or just don't care whether or not it gets spoiled for you then uh let me welcome you to the dark parade and a very black christmas all right folks as promised here is uh yet another guest that i would refer to as inevitable on this show uh, last, uh, no, not last week. The, uh, I'm, I'm recording these slightly out of order. So next episode will be Richard Glenn Schmidt, who I also refer to as inevitable, even though we've already recorded that one. So put that in your timey wimey pipe and smoke it. But, <laughs> uh, with me is, uh, Court Psyops himself of the Cinema Psyops, I think is the, the name of that podcast. And how are uh you, sir? I'm excellent, and I miss the days when you used to Bugs Bunny it up and pronounce it Psyops. Yeah, it's been a while. Like, I, I try not to do the same shtick. Like, I try to throw all the old material out like I'm working out a new album or something. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, but uh, you're right. I should continue to do that because uh, I haven't done it in a while, and now it'll seem fresh to people that are new to uh, the show. Uh, so, <laughs> Well, you did it the right amount. You sprinkle it in just the right amount. Um in doing so and usually it's when you're talking to me or um you're doing something for our show and you pronounce the name that way and i think that's what worked best for the comedy bits because everywhere else you pronounce it normally yeah yeah and part of it too is because i do so much with the show not not directly of course 
But I do a whole lot of like, oh, okay, well, let me pull down Cinema PsyOps for like the YouTube channel and let me make sure I'm posting this and that kind of thing. So it's just kind of gotten stuck in my head without the PsyOps. And uh, I've just got to basically what I'm saying is it's time for another round of electroshock therapy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't think people realize just how much you actually do for all of the shows. Like all the places that we are available and all the links that are are available, that's all Bo's handiwork, man. And we just do the small modicum of things that he asks to make it slightly easier. So everybody that listens to this, that's within the sound of my voice, and regardless of whatever timey wimey time you're listening to this in, Bo makes this shit happen for all of us. And I for one would just like to thank you now that I got the opportunity and you can't stop me from talking about you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's it, it's funny because like right before you jumped on, I was literally loading a different like a show that I don't even touch up, up on YouTube. And those are the moments where I like I appreciate you saying that because there are definitely times where I'm like, nobody knows I do this, but I spent so much time doing it. Um, no, it's it's totally true. And I think more of us need to sing your praises for for that reason alone, because like we're all doing this we're all shouting into a void and we never get any recognition and you're basically making it so that our voice gets an amplifier and no one talks about that like at all and it's just not fair for you man and i i just i wanted to voice that because i'm outraged that i'm even guilty of it oh no no, i again i appreciate it and and it's not you know for what it's worth as you probably have have seen me chat up in uh, our exclusive and private uh, group of podcasting uh conversations on uh, on the facebook um we but, really got to get a shorter title than that that's really inconvenient um i've been trying to get a good uh, anagram for it but so far no luck um, <laughs> but, but uh actually like we've you know speaking of amplification like we have been getting more listeners just across the board not not every show and not every month but um for the most part like our listenership continues to grow um and and like i I see some of the daily numbers where i'm like man that is just not a number we normally like three months ago four months ago even we we weren't pulling down this number in a day and uh and it's really it's cool like uh eventually we are going to hit that sweet, sweet 20,000 mark uh, in a month, and I'm really going to get excited. But Because um, that's, that's when really big things can happen for a network. Yeah, I mean, kind of. That's uh, I mean, this is getting into some real how the sausage is made, but that's where we can start like selling advertising space and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so that would be awesome. And we're, you know, we're not that far off. So, and, and the growth is all headed in the right direction. But, you know, I know a lot of people came to the, this episode wanting to hear about how the mechanics of podcasting work. And that's, you know, you people have now been satisfied. So let's turn our attention instead. <laughs> <laughs> we've done, we've given though, we've thrown enough bones to those jackals. No, uh, w- the reason we're here, uh, ladies and jelly spoons, is to talk about uh, Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas, and and I'm gonna kind of steal the spotlight for a second, just because when I came up with the idea for doing this series, the reason I wanted to do it is because I had never seen Black Christmas in any incarnation, and so I it was really a way to force myself to not only watch the movie but to really you know dive into the into the movies as as we do with all of these as much as we can like look night of the demons three there's not that much meat on the bone in terms of like research and whatnot but then you run into something like black christmas 74 and there's like a great shout factory release that has two discs worth of stuff to uh to ponder over and there's all kinds of articles on the internet and uh, and that kind of thing so it was a treat to dive into a movie that had so much in the way of resources to really uh, like get into the the ins and outs of the film but w- w- is this something that you had seen a bunch of uh about the time that it hit dvd i can't remember exactly which was the first dv dvd that i saw but it was i want to say about like a couple years before the remake even happened because it had a huge resurgence of people that were like black christmas well halloween black christmas 
you know and yeah. I, i'm i'm belittling that in such a way as that people started talking down about every other slasher film because they were just quote unquote ripping off black christmas when i think while john carpenter may have obviously taking ideas from black christmas and done some things that were in black christmas with halloween yes uh not everyone else went back you know this film wasn't as much seen as what halloween ended up becoming in the states at least for where that slasher craze kind of came from yes it was absolutely the first yes i really love this film and i think it's absolutely incredible it still scares the living shit out of me every time i watch it but the dvd release when all of that hubba blew started happening about black christmas and like people really started like what's the term rediscovering it that everybody says or, or that horse shit right um, the, re- but, the reappraisal of black christmas yeah yeah well that was like the very first big dvd release and it was back okay everybody i'm gonna talk like an old man here it was back in the days when netflix used to mail you dvds what netflix would they weren't just a streaming company they would send you <laughs> physical media <laughs> right yeah back in those days that's how i first saw black christmas i got that dvd and i got my wife to get it for me on christmas um so that we could watch it together and it scared the living piss out of me and i loved it and i tried to watch it every year on christmas since so uh it's been that long it goes back that far to back when netflix used to mail you physical media yes yeah all right so let's dive into this uh what what the movie itself is and as you said there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna say that sounds very rote but at the time that the movie came out that wasn't the case and bob clark himself claims that he basically came up with the idea for halloween in a conversation with john carpenter and i've heard him say this a couple of times now where John Carpenter, who was a fan of, of Black Christmas, in again, this is all according to director uh, of and, and co-writer, I think, of, of Black Christmas, Bob Clark. Um, he says that John Carpenter asked him, they, they were talking about a sequel to Black Christmas, and Jar- John Carpenter said, well, what would you do? And he said, well, I, I wouldn't, I would actually just make it so that Billy was still on the loose, set it the the next fall and i would call the movie halloween and now he did not say like oh it's going to be a bunch of babysitters it didn't go that far but he he basically says like the genesis of the movie john carpenter's halloween is this conversation that he had with john carpenter about a sequel that never was to black christmas uh so take that with a grain of salt of course because uh sadly bob clark is no longer with us and we can't get the two of them in a room uh, and I've never heard John Carpenter say that, but I, I find it really interesting. Um, well, John Carpenter is also the kind of guy that would call somebody out for plagiarism and would also call himself out. Because, I mean, in his commentaries, he talks about, you know, how there's certain shots that he would do that he wanted to do because it mimics a certain director that he wanted to emulate. And he's not the only one that obviously does that. I mean, a lot of film work is cannibalism and stuff like that. And it doesn't sound like it was direct outright theft. It just was, you know, if you were going to do this, what would you do? And who knows? Maybe he, maybe they did have the conversation, but I fail to see how writing a film called Halloween, wanting to do your own version of a sequel to Black Christmas is any different than somebody remaking it, you know, like just because it already exists and they know they can make the money off of it. I mean, yeah, yeah, there's probably some monetary things that maybe Bob Clark got cheated out of or whatever, but I mean, when someone continually tells a story of that nature that sounds like someone stole from you, you don't make the other person seem like the bad guy. Yeah, Because all they have to do is just not even comment on it, you know? Sure, and and Bob Clark was not saying it in the context of like that screwy John Carpenter. He done me wrong. It was, it was more like, Oh, a lot of people may not know this, but when everybody talks about how great Halloween was, well, you know, I, I think there's a little more black Christmas and Halloween than some people might give credit for. But also as soon as you realize that this movie preceded Halloween, it's like, Oh, well it, you know, Halloween doesn't seem quite so revolutionary 
when so many of the beats of Halloween exist in Black Christmas. And again, I'm not saying that either movie is better or worse for that. They're both superior slasher films. And the fact that John Carpenter may have been influenced by Bob Clark ain't a complaint. That is just uh, like, oh, I, you know, this movie I loved uh, for so many years, the 78 Halloween, might have roots in a movie that I am only now catching up to. Um, but yeah, I don't, right, right. yeah, I, but I don't, there's, there's no reason to deride or be derisive towards Halloween and saying that it was just a ripoff or theft or anything like that. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit on Carpenter for this in any way, shape or form. Yeah. yeah and yeah. that, that blah, 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 black Christmas thing that I was talking about is something that happened in those early days. I mean, you're a part of the horror community and you were alive and even though you didn't see Black Christmas, do you remember that fervor that was on the mo- the message boards and shit about Black Christmas and John Carpenter and all that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember there being direct attacks on, on John Carpenter, but also even then, I only read so much of that shit before I was like, oh, well, this just sounds like really sad and angry people and I don't want any part of this. Right, and that's the thing that really kind of, for a long time, it turned me off about black christmas and just basically even wanting to talk about being a fan of it because i didn't want to be lumped in with dick wads like that you know i totally did not uh it's i don't know it's like being a fan of i don't know five finger death punch casually which i am totally not but like being like i don't want to be associated with five finger death punch fans right yeah it would be like (laughs) if you really liked an insane clown posse album you know just one album right yeah Yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I'm I'm the same way. Like I, every now and again, when I, especially when I'm talking about this show in particular, when I talk about the dark parade, there, there's a hint of an insult. If somebody went digging for it in there, because what, one of the things I will say is like, Hey, when we talk about these movies, we try to do it in such a way that if you didn't like, even if you're a fan of the movie, you're going to come away from the conversation, knowing something about the movie you didn't know, or hearing the, hopefully a uh, a perspective on the movie that maybe you hadn't considered before and that kind of thing and that that it's a little bit evolved beyond a lot of horror podcasts where it's just people sitting around talking about how awesome the movie is and that's cool there is certainly a place for that it's just not the show i wanted to do um and but i also like have to check myself every now and again Because I don't want it to sound like I'm deriding that kind of podcast when I say that this podcast is different than that. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's there's no need to really to to be derisive in such a way. It's the thing that's a problem is whenever you make divisions or or not necessarily lines in the sand, but when you say certain things about like this is the kind of show or this is the kind of thing that I would like to do, you're not necessarily excluding the type of fan like if i came on here and started gushing about black christmas and how awesome i thought it was and how incredible it was but didn't inter- interrupt the flow of what you wanted to do you would be totally fine with that oh for sure for sure it's it's and and also we have plenty of shows that do talk about how awesome movies are and i would probably be one that's guilty of that on cinema science quite a bit or, well, or the reverse right like we're on pick six we just talk about how shitty it is you know like it's it, it, right it, like it, it's one of those ideas of like I'm, I'm not trying to put somebody down to lift another thing up and uh but yeah yeah and there are plenty of episodes not plenty because we've only done so many of these but there are definitely episodes of dark parade that are just like hey we're talking about let the right one in and we're just going to kind of you know let the love flow for this movie uh, right, and I kind of expect that that's going to be the case here as we're going through Black Christmas. Of there's going to be those like Chris Farley show moments of like, remember when she had the bag over her head and was in the rocking chair? That was awesome, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, totally, totally. And I, when I first watched the movie on DVD all those years ago and fell in love with it, it became my thing that I just kind of kept to myself because that people either like it or they don't. Uh, and if they like it, they seem to really love it and go crazy for it. And if they don't like it, then they're just kind of like, yeah, it was okay, but it was a bit slow. was like kind of the complaint that I got. Because I played this for people on a Christmas horror movie marathon night. And it did not go over well for the most of the audience. And it just wasn't for them. And I was like, okay, well, this will just remain my thing that I love. It's it's my Black Christmas. I'll watch it once a year by myself if I have to. And And I do. I absolutely love watching it by myself. I think that may be why it terrifies me so much, too. 
It's a it's a distinct possibility. Yeah, and it, it's just a well crafted movie to be. Well, so all right, we started to get into it, and then we got sidetracked again because that's what we do. But uh, so let's jump back into what the what the movie actually is. And the the opening scene is really a great setup where we see the sorority house outside it starts right outside our you know our main uh set for the movie which is not a set it's an actual location but you know what i mean and um we see the point of view of this killer looking around through the windows climbs up the the trellis uh finds a a, a way into the attic and in very short order it's like oh there's a killer or at least we don't know he's a killer yet but we know that somebody who breathes heavily and is nefarious um has climbed uh up into this sorority house unseen and is probably up to shenanigans after stalking around the outside of it and finding several other places he could have easily entered and just chose yeah. not to then he goes to the rose trellis and climbs all the way up and it's super fucking creepy and the breathing is not only heavy it's belabored and it sounds like there's something very wrong with this person too yeah uh i don't i don't think they use the actual audio from this but bob clark said that the cameraman for this scene was drunk while they were show while they were filming and he fired him and so this cameraman is only used for this scene <laughs> but it's I that kind of weird shaky off kilter handheld feel of it works for what it's supposed to be uh, right yeah that's what they said after the fact they were like actually this kind of works he was like yeah yeah but he was still drunk on set we can't let that go no he has every right to fire him but what a happy accident to not have to waste the footage for sure for sure and so then we move inside and we start to meet our sorority sisters uh we've got barb uh as played by Margot kidder uh who is a delight as always um she is uh, planning to go home for Christmas, but then gets a call from her mother who is like, hey, I found this dude that I'm hooking up with, so we're going to go away. So Barb's kind of abandoned uh, for Christmas. She actually refers to her mother as a gold-plated whore, which I appreciate. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and anyway, so then she um, is there with, uh, there's Phyllis. Uh, A.K.A. Phil, played by the wonderful Andrea Martin, who will show up in the next episode as the the house mother. Um, there's Jess or Jessica, played by Olivia Hussey from uh, her breast being in Romeo and Juliet fame. <laughs> uh, also, she's an incredible actress and carries this movie. Th this is true, but also I remember seeing Romeo and Juliet in English class at just the right age for her breast to be imprinted on my brain and uh you know look time does weird things to you and uh, uh sure but i i will state that um also that image is firmly impr implanted on my brain for much the same reason for yeah. having that, that movie played with romeo and juliet uh but the teacher saw it and tried to step in front of the tv but much too late and blocked actual story <laughs> Yeah, I mean, our, our teacher didn't even go try. There was no effort made. It was just like, hey, there's going to be boobs. Everybody everybody cool with that? Everybody going to be mature about this? And we were all like, yeah, of course. I mean, we're teenagers. We're not going to be foolish about a pair of something as natural as a pair of human breasts. And then, of course, the scene happens and we're all just like the wolf from Looney Tunes. We're banging a shoe on our head and making auga noises um <laughs> i'm 42 years old and i still make auga noises every time my wife changes in front of me yeah yeah it's a real problem like you never really grow up that much because i do the same thing with my girlfriend like we're both we're all, both almost 50 and any every time that i see her coming out of the shower i'm just like well hello nurse like it's shameful um <laughs> and <laughs> and you know god bless her for tolerating it but uh so Hi. jess ends up getting a phone call from kier dulia playing uh peter um our our pal from 2001 a space odyssey dave um and he is a an aspiring concert pianist uh in this film uh they're all college students but he he's a very uh artsy kind of guy 
And yeah, he lives in a conservatory, and his whole entire purpose is to become the best that he can be so that he can become his concert pianist. And, like, that's all he focuses on. That's the soul of his studies right now. Yeah. And so when Peter calls, Jess is like, Peter, we really need to talk, okay? And that's a pretty dead-on Olivia Hussey impression. Don't even double-check it. But she seems like, all right, we've got some shit to talk about. Either they're about to break up or something is about to go down. And then we get yet another phone call after, like, pretty much the the sorority house is clearing out from, like, all the other sisters and their boyfriends and all that stuff. And they are uh, getting phone calls from a, a, a guy that they refer to as the moaner. And they kind of gather around and it, Barb uh, really takes charge of this scene where she is like, hey, go, you know, pedal this with the Kappa Deltas or whatever. Like, they really need it. And um, the voice ends with him saying, I'm going to kill you. And then hangs up. After she calls him, she's like, go f- fuck yourself, you creep, or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but calling him a creep is what triggered that. Right, right. And, and the other sisters are like, are you sure you want to, like, you might be triggering somebody here. And she's like, we get a million of these. It's just some loser. Don't even sweat it. Definitely not coming from inside the house. Definitely not a real killer. <laughs> Definitely not an actual threat. Not some kind of weird person that is trying to get their jollies off and just blow off some steam so they don't have to kill again. Definitely not that. Yeah. They're definitely not hiding in the attic, and they definitely have not already killed. Absolutely. Uh, and then we Claire is the girl that's like, I don't think this is such a great idea. And Barb kind of lays into her about this. And Claire is just like, hey, look, I'm just trying to help, and I don't need your shit, Barb. And goes upstairs to finish packing because she's going to meet her father and take off but what happens court is that uh she starts to hear something from inside her closet and i really here's where the love begins yeah Yeah, it's the house cat yeah yeah because the killer is making meowing sounds and 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 she also has found like the cat in her room and she she hears the meowing again thinking it's the cat that's gotten in the closet goes into the closet and the killer billy lunges out at her and wraps a bag around her head and smothers her to death and then uh plants her in a rocking chair up in the attic where she will remain for every moment of this movie and after and it is Like, it's the iconic image that you see on the posters and all the the DVD covers and all that stuff, but it is intensely creepy, Uh, especially when the killer puts a a doll in her lap and it starts calling her Agnes. And one of the things that I really love about this movie is there... This gets way blown out of proportion. Not out of proportion, but it it gets really uh, uh, detailed and becomes kind of the crux of the plot for the 2006 Black Christmas. All this Billy and Agnes stuff. But what's great about the original is that none of this is ever explained. You don't ever know this backstory. There's some hints here and there that maybe Agnes is his sister but you don't know that for sure and like all of this is incredibly vague and and it just exists to be the mo of a crazy person and is in no way like uh definable you know what i mean but if you put all the calls back to back like i've recorded all the calls while watching it one time and actually just listened to them all together it does tell a very distinct story enough to where you can piece together what happened and uh apparently billy did something to agnes at first that was bad enough that he started getting beaten severely and punished for it over a long period of time which you are correct in 2006 they do expand upon that quite a bit which is what makes me like that remake because they actually showed you 
the shit that happened that made Billy what he was supposed to be. Whereas, yes, you hear it in the calls, but there is actually a story there if you listen to it back to back. And that is all the stuff that they expand upon. Um, they make it a little bit, obviously, more severe. But the thing that they keep saying is, why would you leave Billy alone with Agnes? And it makes it seem like Billy is deeply troubled and may have molested his little sister. And then when got caught, beat the li- got the living shit beat out of him for a very long period of time. And then possibly ended up killing his sister the last time they were left alone together because of a deepening psychosis that happened from all of this. And I, I don't know, like some folks have, just have posited that the voices that this Billy person's doing as a calling is actually just uh, him getting his rocks off and playing with them until he decides to finally kill him. And it, that he's actually like none of that is actually real. I've, I've heard some folks that have posited that before. But my yeah. thought is that, that that he actually does have the split personalities and he is all of these multiple people and that he's doing all the voices and that all of those voices are actually in his head like an identity kind of situation. And they're all fighting for control. And the thing is, is he's doomed to relive these situations that, that put him in this state for the rest of his life. Like he's some kind of brain trauma has kind of locked him in there or something along those lines. And so those calls are actually him reliving those moments. Is just how I've always interpreted it. Yeah. And that terrifies me more than anything else because the hell that person must be going through. And like the reality is, like every time he's killing, he's re killing that sister. <laughs> yeah. And the the thing that I, I really adore about this is that not only do you like that interpretation sounds like it could be totally true, but it, you can also do the alternate, you know, English lit essay. Uh, where you take the opposite stance that none of it ever happened and you can still kind of support your argument because there's no e- even with this story that he's kind of telling through these phone calls it's still like well you're also dealing with a maniac and you don't know if that's true or like you said is he just fucking with them whatever like whatever your interpretation is I I so enjoy the fact that there's enough uh, like it's nebulous enough that you you can never totally pin it down, and, yeah, and that and makes I, it scarier to me. Yeah, and I totally agree with you, and that's why I absolutely love Black Christmas 1974, and why it terrifies me so much. And I think that the thing that may be a fault or a thing that most people would have as an issue with the 2006 remake of it is they did push into one angle of the story too much and it was in that time era everybody was doing that where you had to know the reasons you had to know the backstory of the killer and everything like that and i think the reason why the 2006 clicked with me like like it did is because my interpretation or how i always just kind of thought what happened happened is literally what they ran with so i'm like oh all right, so you're on the same page with me. So cool. But I like the idea that it's all of these. It could be any of this stuff. And I do like the vagary of it because, I mean, that's the horror happens in your mind. So it's whatever you want it to be. And they need to pull back just enough and give you just enough to make you wonder what the fuck is going on. Whatever those calls are for, whatever they're happening because of, they are absolutely fucking horrifying. And they put you in the exact situation that these ladies are in when they are suffering it. And you are just as uneasy and uncomfortable and scared for them as they are for themselves. Yeah. It's, Oh, it's so good. So in addition to our sorority girls, one of whom is now dead in a rocker in the attic window, there is also, um, Mrs. Uh, Mac who is their somewhat kindly, uh, house mother, who also has a crippling alcohol problem. Uh, Total Bob Clark character, though. He This is his kind of humor all the way. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's funny when you watch the commentary. He's like, okay, and here's another gag about her hiding liquor. You know what? That might be one too many. I think we went one too many on this one. And I, <laughs> I, I find that funny. But yeah, so she has booze hidden all over the place. B um, for booze. Yeah. And... Um, so that's our cast of characters. And then the next day, and th- that's another thing I really like about this movie is that it's not a like, Hey, this is a one night kind of affair where this, you know, much like Halloween, as we uh, were discussing earlier, like all of that movie, of course, takes place on Halloween. Whereas this takes place in the, the Christmas season to be sure. 
but it is not just like oh and on christmas eve you know here comes uh, a deadly santa claus or something um this actually takes place over a couple of days and so we leave clear in the attic her father uh who looks like a used car salesman gets stood up uh, and then goes to the sorority house to see what the hell's going on with Claire. And we discover her, uh, like, or he discovers some picture, like, posters up that he's like, well, I don't know about all of this. This seems like uh, a, a big sex party that all these girls are having here. He's also not uh, privy to the knowledge that his daughter was dating this guy Chris, as played by Art Hendel, in an absolutely amazing raccoon coat. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely incredible. Fur is murder, but uh, give me an imitation version of that and I will take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was of a time, so it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, and also, no, this is before people started throwing paint on you for wearing stuff like and, that. And also, it's raccoons. And I'm not saying you should be cruel to animals or anything like that, but it's not like... You know, we're, there is a, a a deficit of raccoons in the world where we need to protect them as a species. They're cute, they're mischievous, but there's plenty of them. I got like three or four of them behind my house. Uh, not enough to make a coat, but, you know, I'm waiting. I'm waiting <laughs> for after the, after the winter. Wow, you just made me want to watch Pelts. Thanks. You're welcome. And so... Um, m- so there, there's some business with him trying to figure out where Claire is. And everyone agrees, like, hey, Claire is, like, a good girl. D- despite what you may think, Claire did not run off with a guy. She is not that kind of person. She didn't get drunk. She's not doing drugs. Claire is cool. And uh, meanwhile, we also get a bit with Mrs. Mack hearing Claude meowing in somewhere. She's trying to find the cat. And... Uh, believes that the cat is in the attic, but we'll come back to her in a minute. Can we just talk about how Billy is possibly the Michael Winslow of fucking serial killers? All the different voices, the the cat sounds, yeah, yeah, for sure. And he's mimicking the actual cat in the house because he's tricked like two or three people with it already. Yeah, the, some of the best stuff, just in case we forget to talk about this, some of the best stuff is that Billy is present in the house in a way that again to compare it to halloween that michael myers is not michael myers just kind of pops out of nowhere and there he is like you see billy lurking around you see a shadow on the wall a number of times when they're on the phone or not on the phone but or yeah when they're on the phone with other people with like the cops and shit and you see billy just kind of lurking through the house and he's clearly moving around as these girls are going about their business. And I think that is one of the things that's most terrifying about Black Christmas is it's not a killer that you see all the time. And most of the time it, you see a lot of POV stuff, but you you're constantly aware of his presence in the house. And I think that's genuinely chilling. Yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, that's something that I've noticed watching, uh, particularly this year Um I new theater room i'm still working on it i'm in progress i was actually modifying a few things um to be able to watch black christmas like i built a rudimentary shelf that was basically just a one by two (laughs) pallet to protect my blu-ray player from overheating from sitting on top of the stereo or the the surround sound but uh so i had to do that i actually had to pause black christmas because it started overheating the blu-ray player and it made it skip so i had to pause it and go build that real quick and then come back <laughs> um but uh okay so I, I did notice that this year a lot like uh there's a lot of stuff where he's like in the corners or you'll catch a glimpse of a shadow sometimes a little piece of fabric that you may have seen him or like a, a piece of him you do notice a piece of him around or like there's stuff that's moved when characters are talking in a room like you know he's in the room and shit has been moved around and stuff there's a lot of little things like that that they did which is pretty incredible and it's fucking horrifying because he's right there he's just right in plain sight and no one ever sees him because he's just so aware all the time of what's happening he's just like so hyper intuitive and just really good at hiding himself and you get the inclination as he had to be that way because he was sought out and beaten quite a bit as a kid so he had to uh, I okay like just not to reveal too much shit but like there is a certain 
type of person that gets really good at hiding and being quiet and not being found. And it's someone who is often sought out in to, for, for abuse purposes in a home that they can't get out of. And Billy obviously learned that technique. Yeah, and it's also frightening because it's a place where they all feel safe. And so it's not like they're on high alert and looking for someone lurking around. This is their home. This is like the, the home that they share with one another. And the fact that they're not seeing this guy out of their corner of their eye isn't crazy because, you know, when you're at home and you're relaxed, it's not like the defenses are down. And that's, that's why the film terrifies yeah. me that much is because that's exactly what it is where I'm like, one day I'm going to look across the room and there's going to be something in the fucking corner of my house while I'm watching a movie on my, my theater room, you know, and I'll be like, I'm done. Like I got nothing to defend myself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that it's right. It, it's it, it, it like home invasion movies kind of touch on that terror, but I think this is even better in terms of dealing with it because again you as the viewer it's it's very hitchcockian in the sense that you know bob clark is making you the viewer complicit where you're like oh the killer is right over there if you turn around you will see his shadow on the stairwell and they never do but you as the audience you're like oh that billy he is all over the place in, in this movie and he is gonna get them girls um but i i enjoy that a lot i think i think you know bob clark is is sadly uh, taken from us too soon uh, in 2007, but guy could make a movie, like, not just a Christmas... The guy who made a Christmas story made Black Christmas. That's one of those things that it's hard to reconcile with, you know? That he was capable of switching genres so uh, abruptly in his career. And also made Porky's! Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I'm more shocked that the guy that made Porky's is the guy that made... A Christmas story. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, it's crazy. I mean, what a, what a talented guy! Like the the ability to to make those pivots and make good movies out of that genre. You know, uh, even Porky's is a superior teen sex comedy. Uh, that's kind of the one responsible for all the other ones. I mean, that's yeah. what Bob Clark has done the best. Yeah, and like he even says uh, in an interview, he's like, "I'm kind of sorry that." I, I made Black Christmas because so many people copied it badly. And it's you know, like, I get it. You're right. That's one of the reasons I'm not crazy about slashers is because they, they feel so rote. But this, I mean, yes, Peeping Tom came before. Yes, there were other movies that had used POV and that kind of thing. But Bob Clark did some inventive shit with, with Black Christmas in, in a way that hadn't been done before. and But then everyone saw it and and between that and you know halloween a few years later like that established the template and then you get friday the 13th and then you're off to the races Um, within like a three-year span he went from doing children shouldn't play with dead things to making death dream and then black christmas yeah what a run yeah that's again a carpenter level run um, and just and, because he got out of the genre didn't mean he stopped making bad mo- or stopped making good movies. He made great movies from then on. The thing that's really incredible about that is the push upward and the sort of like escalation and the increase in budget and skill as he's learning as a director. And it's actually really impressive. The, the like, I mean, I've seen all of these films, obviously, but Death Dream, I would say, is at least twice the film that children shouldn't play with dead things is. And I think that Black Christmas is definitely like the pinnacle of when he becomes a craftsman and what he does, because his films stay at this quality of production level from here on out or just steadily increase. But like from Black Christmas on, his his work isn't just fallible almost because he does make some really amazing films and just continues to really become an incredible filmmaker. As you as you absolutely mentioned, and it's really kind of heartbreaking to me that he's decided he didn't want to do horror anymore. But I totally understand he's not the first, and he certainly won't be the last. Right, I'm just waiting for Mike Flanagan to decide he wants to do romantic comedies, don't, and don't I will even, don't even put that out into the universe. You know please. what? I'll he's follow him. Right <laughs> yeah, he's going to be the guy who reunites Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, and I'm there for it. Um, God, don't say that. I don't want that to happen. So, <laughs> None of that. So. Uh, we find out what's going on with Jess and Peter. It turns out that 
Jessica is pregnant and Peter is like, well, uh, I guess, you know, I'm going to quit everything and, and we'll have the baby and all that. And she's like, fuck that. I am, I'm getting an abortion just because your plans have changed. Doesn't mean mine do. And I still have a lot of things that I want to get done with my life. And almost none of them are having a baby right now. So, uh, and this is where we set up Peter as kind of the red herring of the movie to suggest that perhaps he has flipped a switch because of uh, finding out about this baby, even though the timeline doesn't line up with Claire and that kind of thing. And, you know, it turns out he is certainly not the killer, but there is a nod to that. When he comes to speak with her and try and convince her to keep the baby and then becomes a red herring, just before that, they do set up that he is snapped and is... Uh, capable of of tremendous violence when he just smashes that piano and utterly destroys it yeah yeah like i said this guy peter wound a little tight he is an art student through and through yeah i recognize um explosive disorder like that where you just explode and destroy shit for no reason like I, i recognize that very easily and like how volatile of a person that can be uh and he certainly has it they play the mental illnesses really deftly in this film but they also portray them in such a way as to be kinder and gentler to them because you do feel sympathy where you're like man this guy is he's wound way too tight he's losing his mind and he needs a break and you can you can see that and you do feel sympathy for him and you do feel terrible for billy because how can you not because something is clearly wrong with him in one way, shape, or form. Yeah. You, know, I, you, you feel terrible for the girls because they're trapped and there's no escape and you can't help them. Per, perhaps it's a, a broken empathy bone, but I do not feel bad for Billy. Billy is a horrifying murderer. <laughs> and and well, should be uh, eliminated with extreme prejudice. If you buy into what's happening in the calls and what he's describing, then you will feel bad for him, which you clearly do not. So, or at least you're not gonna or, you're, but, not, you're not gonna forgive it anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't for, forgive it, right? Like y- you can understand why a person was broken this way, but that I don't know that that necessarily uh, automatically includes sympathy for I, your sympathy for the fact that they were so traumatized that led to this thing. But as soon as you start doing heinous shit like this, it's like, well, it, it sucked what happened to you, but also we got to get you off the streets because Just because somebody wounded you doesn't mean you get to bleed on anyone you want that. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and like, you know, you, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, uh, like an Ed Kemper or something like that, where it's like, Oh, I totally understand why you became a person who killed women. But also, a lot of people uh, have shitty things happen to them and don't kill women. Like, they're either it's, you know, you can argue the nature and nurture and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, it sucks that Ed Kemper's mother was absolutely horrible to him. But he also, you know, heinously murdered a number of women. And that means, you know, you don't get sympathy anymore. You, you get put away. And, and that's what needs to happen to Billy, but uh, as, as we will learn, that doesn't really happen in this movie, which is kind of one of the more terrifying aspects of it. Um, I don't disagree. But, okay, so um, there's uh, there's another call, and there's kind of a call every time somebody is, is killed. And um, he also, you know, as we talked about, he speaks with uh different voices it's actually an actress and a different actor and things like that all doing um parts of the voices for billy like when um they would do the phone calls to the house uh bob clark would essentially do the you know the read of those lines so that the actresses could react but they were so much tamer than what they ultimately adr'd in uh, so that like a lot of the actresses said that when they finally saw the movie, they were like, oh, my God, that's that's what you put in. That's horrible. So anyway, it, 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 it is, too. It is uh, indefensible. The things that he says, uh, as far as I've seen phone calls go. Uh, but when he just like breaks down and starts like crying into the phone and reliving moments over to them, that's when like the phone calls really become horrifying. And I just. 
I don't know, like the kind of pain that he's got to be in to be like that is where I draw the sympathy. Absolutely. But like, of course, the minute he starts bleeding on someone else from a wound that, you know, they didn't even create, that's uh, that's yeah. where he's at fault. Yeah. You like kill your own mother or whatever. But, you know, that that's a thing that can come out at the trial. But yeah, when you start hiding in people's attics and, you know, p- propping them up in rocking chairs, that becomes like a, a public problem. Um, right. But- when you're when you're not getting vengeance, when you're literally just hurting people because you are yourself are hurt, that's when you become the monster. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, they decide ultimately that they're going to file a missing persons report because Claire still hasn't shown up. And so uh, Phyllis and Barb go with Claire's dad to the police station, which is one of my favorite scenes where uh, the police kind of blow them off. And uh, but they say, like, hey, we'll call you if something comes up. Do you give me the number of the sorority house? And this is where Barb, a.k.a. Margot Kidder, says, oh, yeah, it's a fellatio two zero eight eight zero and he's like fellatio and she's like yeah it's a new exchange and this is back in the days when it was like you know uh call pinewood nine four three please that kind of shit uh but it's it's pretty funny and uh so he writes it down he's like okay well we'll give you a call at fellatio two zero eight eight zero if anything comes up and um that will pay off uh later when John Saxon is trying to call the house and this dumbass uh, Sergeant Nash is like, oh yeah, it's fellatio 20880. And my favorite part of that is there's one detective just losing his shit at the desk knowing full well, like, oh, this guy got had. He is so stupid. Uh, Bob Clark reuses this in Porky's. The yeah. same thing where uh, the trying to describe the penis or draw the penis or, or whatever... You know, have you seen this prick? And the guys are laughing, just losing their shit. And there's one guy trying to hold his stuff together. He reused this sequence like that. Yeah, it's, oh, it's so funny. I I really love it. And John Saxon uh, tells him, like, Nash, you couldn't pick your own nose without written instructions. And Sergeant Nash, to his credit, at least at this point, puts together like, oh, this is dirty, isn't it? And that's the line that gets me. It's, yeah, it's him realizing like, oh, not only have I been had, I've been. It, it's like it, it, they made him spell boobs on his calculator or something. It. Oh, I love it so much. It's so funny. He wrote pen fifteen on the back of his hand to be a member of the club. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, with the police being absolutely no help, um, Jessica goes to Chris, aka Art Hindle. Um, and he says like, oh, look, I don't, I have no idea, uh, where Claire is. And also I'm really pissed off that the police are not helping you. And so, um, they end up going back to the police station where Chris kind of gives Sergeant Nash the business. And this is where John Saxon like fully comes into the movie and he's like, oh, okay. So you're telling me that a girl has gone missing and also, this same sorority house is getting a bunch of obscene phone calls. And also, there's another missing persons report about this 13-year-old girl that's gone missing. And John Saxon, being an actual, you know, capable cop, is like, you know, something might be going on around here in the old town of Bedford. <laughs> and uh, so, on the back end of that, we've got a, a, a great scene where... Barb gets completely liquored up at a dinner at the uh, at the sorority house where she talks about going to watch sea turtles fuck for four days, but then got, <laughs> then gets bored. Uh, Can I just talk about how Barb is kind of my kind of woman? Like, like, well, sure. definitely is my kind of woman. You know, yeah, <laughs> just all around. <laughs> well, there there's a hint, or, or at least the filmmakers try to uh, imply that Barb may have been at least bisexual because you see her kind of flipping through a playboy and so forth. And she's kind of that rough and tumble gal that, uh, you know, was associated with not being the girly girl. Um, another quick note about this is Margot Kidder got honest to goodness drunk for this scene. So there you go. I mean, yeah, 
I'm not all that shocked. She had problems early on in her career, so. <laughs> yeah. And But anyway, they finally just send Barb to bed, where they're like, look, Barb, you're drunk. You're hilarious, but you're also drunk, and we've got to get you upstairs. And um, also, we have learned that there, this girl, this 13-year-old girl, uh, has disappeared. Like, uh, Jess and Chris show up to kind of let the rest of the house know like oh yeah this little girl went missing too and um mrs mac then says well you girls be safe i'm i might stick around but i'm probably going to go to my sister's house so when you guys get back from helping to look for this little girl i'm probably going to be gone not knowing that she's about to get murdered by billy who ends up uh putting her on a big hook uh, and and dragging her up into the attic once all the girls leave, and then impales her under the chin, and and hangs her up in the attic. Yeah, that block and tackle was there specifically so people could lift things easily into the attic without much, you know, hoisting up a ladder and breaking your back. It's pretty ingenious. Yeah, it's a great idea until you've got a Billy in the attic using it to kill you, and then it seems like well maybe we shouldn't have had that after all. But, yeah, usually a Billy will work his way from the attic down through to the basement. That's usually where you run into a Billy. That's your biggest problem. Yeah. Once they get in the walls and breed and you got four or five of them Billies running around, you just got to move out and burn it all down. Yeah, you got a real 2006 Black Christmas situation there. Right, yeah. You got a <laughs> Billy and an Agnes? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> Spoiler alerts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the movie's 15 years old if you haven't caught up to it at this point. Um, so... They they do uh, find the body of this girl though this this girl Janice they they ultimately find her body um, they all go back to the house where another phone call comes in and this time Jess actually calls the police and is like hey we're getting all these obscene phone calls you need to start tracing them which the police do thanks to John Saxon not Sergeant Nash who's like hey what are you gonna do. And John Saxon's like, dumbass, we just found a body and now we've got some creep calling this sorority house where there's also a missing girl. Maybe we should do police work. And he's like, all right, I guess. <laughs> Why is everybody always picking on me? Everybody hates Sergeant Nash. Um, and uh, so we. this is about the time we get the scene with... Uh, peter proposing to jessica and she she just could totally shuts him down and is like i am i i have no interest in this and he says that uh she's gonna kill their baby and then gets mad and stalks off uh again this is real like red herring kind of shit of of trying to portray uh peter as potentially uh billy he does say some pretty hateful and toxic masculinity bullshit at her that is really fucking gross beyond what you described and thank you for the brevity in that situation but he goes to the point where there would be a part of me that would want to throttle that man for being rude oh for sure but one of the interesting things about this you know it's kind of looking at it through the the prism of history but for a movie in 1974 to have a woman brazenly saying I'm going to have an abortion was crazy and and having her be the the heroine of the movie nonetheless you know uh that peter's attitude was more reflective of the attitude of the time and uh again kudos to bob clark for having the you know the sack to be like no we're gonna have a woman in this movie an adult woman who is considering an abortion and it's not gonna be a character flaw um so i i i one of those things of like boy that bob clark you know was not it's not in your face kind of daring filmmaking but it's just those little details that make him a a braver filmmaker than people give him credit for i think Um, he's significantly subversive and i think he deals in a lot of the same shades of subversion as what john waters really took in excess yeah. yeah two different approaches like john waters wanted to make you squirm and Bob Clark was more interested in in doing like a narrative of telling a story, but also, hey, I'm also I'm gonna put my politics in the movie, 
whether you like it or not. And, um, and, and stood his ground. Like there were a couple of notes that they got. One of them being the thing about the abortion. They were like, how about you cut that out? And he was like, how about you go fuck yourself? How about that? Uh, and there was another note about the end of the movie of like, well, how about we don't end on the, the phone ringing? And he was like, how about we do? And, um, (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's great that he stood his ground because in a lot of cases, when he did do those fights, he was correct. And everything that you've described for Black Christmas that he fought for, he was correct. That was the right choice. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, So we've got uh, a guy named Graham, (laughs) like Alexander Graham Bell, um, who is doing all the phone tap stuff. And this, again, this is kind of the days before computer automation where when a phone would ring, there would be this somewhat automated physical connection between the lines. And there's great sequences of when Billy is calling of him, this guy Graham, chasing in through the phone room to see what exchange is being connected. When they say they would run a trace, this is how they used to have to do it. That's why they took so long, and they needed at least 50 seconds to go across all of those switches. Yeah, it's really cool. It's it's one of the few times I think I've ever seen, like, in movies they talk about running a trace on phones all the time, and it's one of the few movies from that era that was like, oh, and here's how it's done. And I found that really fascinating. I thought that was a really, really cool scene. That's amazing. You're, that's exactly how I felt while watching it, too. I was really intrigued by it. And it, it's every bit my love of people going through microfiche to try and find out what the uh, what the problem is or what it is that they're cursed with or yeah, who it is sure. that's back from the dead or whatever. Well, and it's just getting the details right of like, hey, here's a thing that you, you hear, a, you know, two dozen movies reference but we're going to show you what the physical reality of that is. So when they say, Hey, you've got to keep them on the line. It's not just didactic exposition. It's like, Oh yeah, you do have to keep them on the line because Graham's in that room and he's got to chase down to see where the, the lines connecting. Um, it's, it's very cool. I really like it. Can I do a quick side tangent about those uh, switch rooms and running a trace and stuff? Yeah, please. Uh, So uh, my uncle worked for the phone company for the bulk of his life. And he worked in a rural phone company uh, in like an upstate New York area. And it was in like they had an exchange that they serviced like multiple areas or counties or something like that. But they had one centralized switch hub that was exactly like that for a very long time that they didn't upgrade to computerize. And their techs, someone had to be there pretty much 24 hours and monitoring all of that. Um, although they did have sensors as well too, but they had like a coverage thing that they had to do. And my uncle was actually there. Like one of the only times a trace was needed to go through that station. And he got to do that. That's and he, cool. was, he was describing it. And he actually took me to it as a kid and showed me like what he was talking about. So when I saw this in the movie, I already knew exactly what it was that they were doing. And so I have this connection where I get to remember my uncle, like proudly telling me this story of how, like the one time he was needed, he was able to be of service and, you know, like did this trace or whatever. And it was super cool, man. And I get to, I I relive it every time I watch this movie. So I I just, I don't know. I thought maybe, you know, with the whole holiday cheer time of year, like everybody would like to know that loving, touching story there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So it warms the, the cockles of the heart. The subcockles, yes. Yeah, down in the subcockles. Um, so after, uh, you know, they're told like, hey, you got to keep this dude on the line. Um, there's a moment between uh, Phyllis and Jess where Phyllis is like, I'm 100% sure now that Claire is dead. I don't know why I know that, but I know that. And Jess is like, no, no, she is going to be fine. And Phyllis goes off to bed we see the killer billy slip into barb's room who has been put to bed because she was drunk if you'll recall (laughs) once again my kind of girl other than the uh, other than other than the elitism and the classism when she talks about you can't rape a townie i'm really digging her yeah yeah, you can't rape a townie is pretty funny um (laughs) offensively so yes yes so she (laughs) she is in her bedroom billy slips in and then she starts having an asthma attack. She starts like calling out 
and Jessica runs in to help her. And the thing that's, again, kind of wonderfully creepy about this scene is it's a false kill because, oh, she's she is not actually being killed by Billy. She's just having this asthma attack. And Jessica is there to help her. But we know as the audience, Billy is in that room. And we don't, like, he's either behind the door, he's in the closet, something. But he's in the room with them. And it's just waiting for Jessica to leave. I picture him sort of perched up in the corner, like a comic book character, and hoping nobody notices he's at the ceiling. It's it's so good. I lo- oh, I love this so much. And then uh, Jessica helps her with the inhaler. She, you know, Barb kind of calms down. And she's like, I had this weird dream where somebody was in the room. And Jessica's like, oh, that's so silly. Okay, hey, Christmas carolers, I will see you later. And so she goes down <laughs> downstairs to, uh, you know, throw some cash at these Christmas carolers. And meanwhile, Billy comes out of uh, hiding in uh, Barb's room and grabs this, like, glass uh, 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 ornament. It's a glass unicorn. And, and stabs Margot Kidder to death with this. And the thing I love about this murder scene is that as he's, you know, slamming this unicorn horn into Margot Kidder, which is very tastefully done. Like, this movie is not super bloody at the end of the day. But the close-up shots of the carolers' mouths opening as the scream is, is happening upstairs is just again it's one of those wonderful little bob clark touches where it's like man you're such a good filmmaker that even this like the lazy way to do this is to make that kill super gory the the cool way to do it is what happens here where you're intercutting the carolers and you're seeing the murder happen through this prism of uh, like a glass uh baubles on the counter and you see the uh, unicorn getting bloodier with every upswing and that kind of thing, where, it, you know, it's much more theater of the mind, but it's it's just artful, it's well done. It's just, it's fucking good. I like that they can show you so little, yet make you feel so much suffering. It's rivaled really closely with the curling iron scene in Sleepaway Camp, where the girl is killed with the curling iron by where it's inserted and she's burned to death. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, because you have to play that out in your mind and they use shadow and they force you to think about it. And the way they're doing the stabbing and where he was positioned and the downward stabbing that he's doing in the frenzy that he does it in, it really does kind of rival what Hitchcock was doing with the stabbing in the shower scene in Psycho. Like, it it mimics it almost perfectly where he shows you just enough to make you feel that when you're not really seeing as much as you think you're seeing. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was excellent at that, too, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the most famous example where you think you you see a lot more than you actually see in that movie. Uh, Toby Hooper was fantastic at at that same trick. Um, Yeah, Yeah, it, like, subliminally implants fucking trauma in your brain. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it's so good. I'm such a Bob Clark fan at this point. So, um, yeah. So the Carolers get <laughs> scooted off because of you know finding this body of a 13 year old and all. And they're like, hey, maybe you ought to. Everybody ought to go home tonight until we figure out what the fuck is going on around here. And <laughs> we got a bunch of killer bait running around singing songs door to door. This is not good. Break it up, people. Break it up. <laughs> right. We- we we need you all in individual locations so that you're all not killed. Um, and just <laughs> mowed down by a child killer. Get in a room with very little windows, lock the door, and bar the windows. Yeah, don't even your parents don't let them in. You just you get in a room and you wait until Christmas morning. It's like the advice the guy gives in. Uh... <laughs> Oh, God damn it. The terror at Shadow Woods. Uh, Blood Rage. Blood Rage is what oh. most people know it by. Where he tells that little girl where he's like, don't open the door for anybody. No matter what they say. Nobody. And that fucking screws over another character later on. It's exactly that. That's what you have to do to survive this shit. Yeah. Yeah. You, hey, look, we're, there's going to be collateral damage. Not everybody's going to make it. But most will. That's the important thing. Yeah. Um, that's why you get into a room with very few windows. Lock yeah. the fucking door and bar the windows. And... 
so uh, there there's another phone call from Peter. Uh, well, there's a phone call from Billy first, and then one on, right on top of that uh, from Peter. And this is where they start questioning her about, well, maybe it is Peter. And, you know, because John Saxon at, at a certain point also goes to the conservatory and sees this piano that Peter smashed up after he thinks he, he failed a, a rehearsal. Um, but also... Jess is pretty clear, like, oh, no, 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 it's definitely not Peter, because um, he was at the house when one of the calls came through. So it's definitely not Peter, and so we kind of rule him out as a suspect. And Jess is now like, okay, well, it's, you know, me and Phyllis and Barb in the house, Miss Mac is gone, Claire is missing, but we know for sure that there is no there is no Peter problem. And so they go around the house and wisely lock all the doors and windows and everything. But unbeknownst to them, Billy's already in the house, right? So um, then they get another phone call after Phyllis is uh, going to bed. She goes to check on Barb first, and that's where Billy gets her. We don't really see what's up but um sure enough like she walks in the room and billy says agnes and then door slam shut you know she is she is now yet another victim of billy and so un- again unbeknownst to jessica she is the only survivor left in this house and thanks to the last phone call that billy made they have been able to trace the call and this is the you know now now famous trope of the call is coming from inside the house. Uh, not the first movie to do it. Uh, I double check that. This is not the first movie to do that, but uh, it is one of the first. There are like two or three other examples in cinema prior to this of, of that same gag being used. It but, was an urban legend beforehand that they talked about with a babysitter and all yeah, of that. So. For sure. So, um, but yeah, the, and, so Nash calls the, the the house and he's like, look, I don't I need you to do something for me without asking any questions. Who's in the house? And she's like, well, it's me and Barb and Phyllis. And he's like, OK, I need you to very calmly put the phone down, walk out the front door and just keep moving. And the police are going to be there in a minute. And she's like, well, OK, I'll go get Barb and Phyllis. And he's like, no, nope, God damn it. No. I just said you need to put the phone down and very calmly walk out the front door. And uh, she is like, okay, but I need to get my friends. And he's like, all right, listen, I didn't want to be the one to tell you this, but all these phone calls that you're getting, they're coming from inside the house. And that's why I need you to leave immediately. But of course he's flustered and panicked and terrified for her. And that's why he does the infamous delivery of it, of the calls are coming from inside the house yeah and so jess starts screaming upstairs for phyllis and barb to come in but nobody answers so she grabs a fire poker and goes upstairs to look and sure enough in barb's room the the bodies of phyllis and barb have been placed on the bed and then she looks at the door because we're, we're hearing some whispering and in the crack of the door, Billy is watching her from behind the door that she has just come in. And uh, the line that he has here is, Agnes, it's me. Billy, don't tell what we did. And then, which is creepy as shit, and Jessica uh, slams the door, runs. Um, Billy runs after her. Um this all ends up in the cellar where Peter uh, breaks in and uh, he's like hey what's going on in here Um, and then the cops show up and they find the patrolman that was supposed to be watching the house dead in his car they hear screaming from inside the house bust in rush down to the basement and when they get there it looks like they're both dead, but it turns out only Peter is dead. 
but we have no idea. It. I mean, I, I guess the implication is that she has killed Peter in a panic? Question mark? I think that she lost it at that moment and went into a sort of fight or flight reflex and did believe that it was Peter because he was the only one around and he's trying a different tactic to get to her. And I do believe, yes, she did attack him and kill him. Yeah, so... And this is kind of the wrap up of the movie is that, hey, we've, you know, we've got um, Jessica in bed. They believe that she has killed the murderer. The police do. Um, and he's as like, does she really. They all kind of, as does she at that point. I well, mean, yeah, for sure. Everyone, everyone is convinced that like it was him the entire time that he was doing all the voices that he was capable of it because he's this pianist and creative dude. And knows music, so maybe he could pitch his voice in different ways or whatever. Yeah. Or recorded it ahead of time. Like, they do kind of talk about it as they're wrapping her up, like, of how they still think it's him. Right. Yeah, they're like, well, clearly we've, we've you know, she took care of the killer for us. Um, we need to get this Mr. Harrison dude to the hospital because he's in shock. And we're going to leave a police officer on the porch just to make sure nobody comes in. In the meantime, we're just going to let her rest. And so they all take off, leaving her alone in this bedroom. And then we see the attic door open up and Billy comes climbing down with his, you know, Agnes, it's me, Billy. And the camera just does a pull back from the house as the phone rings and rings and rings. And that's kind of it. Now, does he call after he's killed someone? That's right. That that has been the pattern all through the movie, and I, I and I think that's, I I think the implication is he has killed Jessica and is now making another phone call. Yep, and he also put on the Manos Hands of Fate sweater that she was wearing earlier and decided to parade that around himself. Sure, sure. Why wouldn't you? Um, it's an it's an awesome ugly sweater. Um. <laughs> to to impress Torgo and all the others in the uh, Manos Hands of Fate fan club, um, so yeah, and so that that's kind of the the story of of Black Christmas, um, and like we we enjoy on the Dark Parade here is we like to start by just talking about some of the performances before we get into uh, you know sort of summarizing our feelings on the movie, but. Um, I, you know, I just, this is one of those movies that punches above its weight for being an independent Canadian film. It is, you know, Andrea Martin is amazing. Margot Kidder is terrific in this movie. John Saxon is just the best. Kier Dulia is adequately creepy and weird. And Olivia, uh, Olivia Hussey is just so, like, sweet and innocent. And despite all the, the talk of, abortions and killing babies and all that kind of thing um she she's kind of the character that you're absolutely behind you're rooting for her every step of the way and uh even at the end when she makes some bad decisions you're like well i kind of get it like these are her friends and she is armed at least but nah, it doesn't do her no good uh but any any special shout outs to this cast that you would like to make no, actually, I agree with uh, everything uh, that you had to say uh, as far as what the cast actually did. Um, I already said that I feel that Olivia Hussey carries this film. Uh, she is really, really excellent at portraying um, being confused and disturbed and upset. Uh, and I think if they would have tried to put Margot Kidder in something like that, I don't think the type of vulnerability they were looking for, they would have gotten out of Margot Kidder because she, yeah. she's not that person. So uh, having Olivia Hussey be the one that obviously is doing that, I mean, she is perfect for that. It's like when you want someone to be able to portray trauma and um, emotional suffering very visibly on screen, you go to Olivia Hussey or you get yourself D. Wallace. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, D. D. Wallace would have been a little young here, so... Uh, right, right, you know what I mean. Yeah. You know what I mean. Like, that's it's you need an actress that, that, that can do that, obviously. Like, that's that's why D. Wallace was so great in The Howling, and she carries that film, because oh, you're suffering sure. right along with her, you know. Um, uh, 
This is my favorite John Saxon as a tough talking cop because he actually has some moments where he's like, I don't care about the life decisions that don't affect the law. Just I need to know everything because it may affect the outcome of the investigation and I'm trying to keep you safe. I love the way that he was hard nosed, but not judgmental. And I really enjoyed that character for Fuller. Yeah, yeah, he's great in it. I like uh, Art Hindle as as Chris and the fur coat is a lot of fun. I think Lynn Griffin at Claire, she's not in the movie a ton. Well, she's in it a lot because you constantly see her in the rocking chair and she does a great job of being dead. Um, It's a really like that sounds like an easy performance of just sit there and don't do nothing. But there are long protracted takes of her where she does not blink she doesn't breathe she doesn't move her eyes any of that stuff and it's it's great like i i really appreciate an actor that can you know play dead well and it really increases those shots too because they circle around her corpse in that chair and do all sorts of really interesting stuff moving around and while this is going on like she's not moving she's not breathing and i'm one of those assholes that watches a horror movie and waits to see if they can find an actor fuck up I've found fuck ups and morgues all over the stuff that that I've watched in horror movies and TV shows like CSI and stuff where I'm like, up, oh, twitched, up, oh, blinked, you know, something like that. Yep, that you guy know, farted. Oh, I heard him. Yeah, and then the eyes moved, you know. And this guy, he's playing Galica. He thinks we didn't notice, but we have. Yeah. Yeah. And um there was an interview with her where she talks about how uh she had been a swimmer, I think, in college. And she was like, Oh yeah, I can just hold my breath for a really long time. I was like, great, it works. Like, they they held on that shot for a long time, and normal people would have breathed, so well done, Lynn Griffin. Yeah, Um, not only only the not breathing, but the not moving and some of the involuntary spasms, and, like, a bag on her head, her eyes never blink, she she never moves her, like, there's no twitching from a nose being tickled from the bag being over or anything. She's just perfectly still. The type of control that takes to just hold still for the extended periods that she does, like... The, the the film is very much carried for the horror on her back with that. That's a, it's incredible. Yeah, she she's very good. Um, what else has Lynn Griffin done? Uh, she was in Curtains. She was in Strange Brew. Oh, she was the um, the the main female lead in Strange Brew. That's where I know her from. Ah, so that's what that's all about, eh? Hey, hey, jelly donut coming. Um, but, and is still like doing it in TV movies and shorts and stuff like that. It looks like she got herself a little bit of that, uh, lifetime money and is popping up in a bunch of those. But anyway, Lynn Griffin, hats off to you. Way to not breathe. Um, I also, I want to focus a little bit on, uh, Andrea Martin, who mm-hmm. Phyllis Phil, um, I'm so used to her in like groundlings and comedic type roles and scenarios where you see her working with all of the comedians and such. And I am not used to her being so um, like the straight man kind of delivery with everything and kind of being the sounding board that everybody bounces off of. But she does it really, really well. Like, you know, she, she totally pulls an abbot to the Costello for everybody. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. She's terrific, and I mean, Andrew Martin's just great in everything. She's uh, uh, one of those one of those actors that when you see him pop up in a movie, you're like, okay, well, she's going to be good. You know, I don't know how this movie's going to be, but Andrew Martin is is, uh, is going to be quality and usually very funny. Um, but you're right; it's interesting to see her in a role that asks her to not be funny at all. Well, um, this is even before really, I think, her career in comedy, right? Like, this is one of the earliest things that she did, isn't it? Yeah, there's um we'll we'll get to it on the the things you may not know. Oh, okay. I'll we'll set it up here and just uh deliver that later then. Uh, uh we can go ahead and let this go, but yeah, th- so originally uh this was supposed to be Gilda Radner. Uh was oh. who who was going to be cast in the role of Phyllis and she couldn't do it because of a little show called uh the Saturday Night Live that she got cast in. Um so, or I think she, it was like some uh, one of the Groundlings things or something like that, where she got pulled away from from doing it because of scheduling, and Andrea Martin filled in. But that almost went. In fact, she had been cast as Phyllis uh, Gilda Radner had. So uh, 
I love Andrea Martin, but a world where I could get like a pre SNL Gilda Radner in a horror film is the kind of world where I could probably be content. Yeah, it it, it would be a really fascinating uh, performance, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we all agree the cast is great, but uh, let's talk about themes. And this is where I'm going to sound kind of stupid, but I don't know that this movie really travels in in deep themes. I think my own take on it, at least, is that this is just a, a movie of like, hey, we want to make a scary movie. And we're going to borrow a little bit from, you know, these serial killer stories and we're going to, you know, set it around Christmas and then that's it. I did like, whereas the, the 06 version has very specific themes. I think this is not that heady. I think it's just like, we want to make a scary movie. I think it's intentionally vague because Bob Clark is very adept at making horror and he's very good at making you fill in the blanks yourself, which he knows will terrify you more. It's the, the economy of horror is what he is. The economy of filmmaking in general is what Clark is excellent at. But I mean, when it comes when it comes to horror, he knows how to do it without having to put a bunch of bucks on the screen to do it. You know, like, yeah, that's I, I believe that that's the intention for it. And not digging too deep and just basically having it be the situation where there is a killer that has been in your house, following you around, learning your routines, and picking you off one by one while making obscene phone calls immediately after doing it. Counting the girl that he killed on the way there because their first call is right after that girl supposedly died. Because she yeah. was found a few days later. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, unlike something... Something like the 06 uh, uh, Black Christmas, which deals in issues of family and sisterhood and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Um, or Death Dream, for example, is very much a, a story about the wages of war and, you know, uh, soldiers returning from Vietnam not being quite the same as they were when they went. Um, this movie, I think, is a little more straightforward and and all the better for it. You know, I'm like, I'm not complaining because there's not some deep subtext here and, and certainly nothing that Clark himself ever pointed out that I'm aware of. Um, well, there there is some underlying general messages and themes that get repeated in the genre, as Barb Clark said, in a bad ripoff uh, version that does happen later on. I mean, like if Margot Kidder would have given them the actual correct number, how many lives could that have saved? To the police? Yeah. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, but I mean, there's there's decisions that are made throughout the film that you could you could see where it's like, I mean, yes, she's a kid. She's just fucking off. She's just being a prick to a cop. That's a prick because he was he was a prick. Um, so there, there's plenty of different things like that. And I'm not trying to say that it is super deep, but as far as um, just a serial killer procedural thing, this is it feels so much more like a ahead of its time sort of proto CSI type show where we're, we're stuck with the killer and then we're seeing the forensics of how they actually go to find him and everything like that in the background like if you remove the fact that we're in the house the entire time with the girls and follow the police like we do for a good portion of the film it's very much like that with that procedural and giving you the very serious technical aspects of it of, of what's going on and that that's a very interesting um kind of new dynamic that he's trying that sort of thing out and it's more fun because i don't i don't i mean yeah there's there's cops looking for killers and there's like the sort of uh hunt for jack the ripper type movies and procedurals and stuff like that but this one gets really involved in technical aspects and almost the science of it like with that tracing at the phone company and I, I feel like that makes it unique enough to where maybe that's what the stuff you wanted to do is like let's let's go nuts and bolts more than deep underlying messages of uh what it's like for a vietnam vet to return for more you know like i feel like he's for sure yeah, moved, yeah moved on and this is this is the kind of the variations of the theme that he's looking for there like i i just don't feel like that was what he was interested in because it's so focused in on the details and the minutia and the drama of their lives he's very clearly wanting to move from horror already which is why i think a lot of people find this a slow-paced film or at least that's the complaint i hear most often about it um, but I'm just engrossed with it. I like. I want to be a part of like everything that's going on, and really just want to know all of the details of all the conversations and everything. And I'm always engrossed with it, always. 
Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think we're kind of landing squarely into sort of our wrap up thoughts before we we rate this, but um, yeah, I totally agree. I think the pace is great. Um, I think the fact that you are allowing some breathing room in between those first couple of kills and then the last, you know, what, 30, 40 minutes of the movie is just this one night in the house. And you've got, you know, you've got John Saxon kind of dancing around the periphery of it and the red herring of Peter and things like that. But even after watching this, what, three times now over the past couple of weeks, um, you know, it's. I, I think the pacing is dead on because I like these characters. I, I like the, like the scene with Margot Kidder getting drunk and talking about sea turtles fucking is a scene that you if if all you are here for is I want to see people getting killed. Of course, that scene is not going to do much for you. But if you're actually looking for a movie where there are characters who you know think and feel things and because the the tail end of that scene as funny as it is is her kind of revealing like oh you all think that i'm responsible for claire being missing because of what i said to her after that phone call and that she's getting blasted drunk at this dinner because she feels this incredible weight of guilt and that kind of stuff is fascinating and and it makes for real characters and even like you said as brash as she is and can be somewhat abrasive you know having jessica take care of her when she's having that asthma attack makes her very sympathetic and you're like oh well despite all these terrible things she said about townies or whatever you know she's still a a vulnerable human being and you know in short order we see how vulnerable but um you know, it's like you you mix that pacing in with some really great camera work, um, all the attention to detail stuff about the shadows, like all the stuff we were talking about, uh, kind of implying that Billy is sort of right around the corner all the time in this movie. Um, the creepy imagery alone just makes this a classic. Like I, I'm late to the party on it, but I'm happy I showed up. I love this movie. I think it's just. Uh, I mean, it's just brilliant. It, it's a wonderful, like, it's a great director doing a great horror movie. And I'll take that every day of the week. I, I enjoyed every, like, some of this I was required to, not required, but, you know, self-imposed requirement of watching the movie a couple of times. And let me watch it this time with commentary and all that fun stuff. And I was never bored at any point in any of those watches because it's also only 90 minutes long. This thing hums along despite all the uh, heathens who might call it uh, dull. But yeah, that that's where I land on it. Do you have any, any other uh, praise you would like to heap on this movie? I mean, just me saying and the people that really know me well, when I say that a film scares the shit out of me, it has to get up early and work hard to do it. And the reason that I feel like it doesn't work for a lot of people is this is not a group watch film. This is a very intimate watch like you would a murder mystery you are trying to actively figure out type of horror film. You have to view it in that state. So if that means alone and you're paying attention and you put your fucking phone away, then do it. Because it will reward you for that. Because I promise you, the bigger you can see it, the more detail that you can make out, the more things you can see that Billy is fucking with in the background and no one's noticing and the scared more fucking the more fucking horrified you will get. Yeah, the details matter in this movie. Like, wh whether it's the shadow on the wall or, you know, the way that the characters are talking to each other. Because these are honest-to-goodness actors who are trying to inhabit a character, and they have their own thoughts and feelings, and you see those expressed in the way they talk to each other. And sometimes that's contentious, and sometimes, like, you know, Phyllis is always, like you said, she's kind of the sounding board, but is always trying to keep everything calm but there's a point in the movie where she breaks down and she's like we're all fucked like i i know claire's dead and i i don't know whose fault that is but that's really sinking in and i'm starting to really believe that one of our friends is dead now and yeah you know, like you said if if what you're looking for is a grindhouse kind of horror movie that's just not what black christmas is it's not it's not a, a slasher in the traditional sense where you're just setting these characters up so that they will be killed 
Um, you are basically creating a drama of sorts in which a murderer is being creepy as shit and murdering these girls. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and that's why it's terrifying, I think, is that it's grounded in a way that a lot of slashers are not. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's before really the huge boom that, that Halloween absolutely created. Um, it's still not the first of this kind of following a killer or fo following a mentally ill person that goes on a killing spree, particularly with point of view, like you said. Uh, what is the, the British film with the guy with the camera and the tripod that has the stabbing in it? That's uh, Peeping Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. I got there. It took me a second. I had to think about it, and then I got the poster in my head. Peeping Tom is the name of the film. Uh, yeah, Peeping Tom is really kind of the first. Um, I like to argue that like the first true slasher film in my mind was actually made by Herschel Gordon Lewis with Blood Feast because it's everything you want in a slasher film and more, and it took forever for everybody else to catch up to him. Yeah, it's... I mean, it's done on the cheap, to be sure, but it, it's fun. I didn't say it was good. I said it was everything I wanted yeah. to slash your film. <laughs> um, well, let's... All right, so let, let's rate this. I'll, uh, please go right ahead. Remember, one to five stars. You can do half stars. Where does Black Christmas land? I'm mashing on five, trying to get an extra half over, and you're looking at me sternly telling me to stop because I'm going to break it before anybody else can rate it, and I just won't. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. This is a five-star movie. This is... Like, this is a movie that belongs in your collection if you're a horror fan. Um, you know, maybe give it a watch first to make sure that you're not stupid. <laughs> and, and watch it and you're like, oh no, it's kind of dumb. Uh, as long as you're not one of them knuckle-draggers. Um, wow. <laughs> I know. Shots fired. Um, no, as long you're, as... Be you're becoming one of those b -b Black Christmas guys with that comment, Bo. I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, like again, I'm late to the party, and I, and I just feel like it, I I feel such joy in finding a movie like this where I'm like I've heard about this movie forever. Can it live up to the hype? And then you watch and you're like, oh, the hype doesn't do this movie justice. This is actually like really good filmmaking, not just a good horror movie. Um, and it, my favorite thing in the world. I, I've said this a number of times. Like, I would rather watch a bad horror movie than a good drama most days. And when I can find a movie that is not only a horror movie, but it's a real damn good one that I haven't seen, then, oh my goodness, what a happy day that is. And uh, so, I, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's just, it, it's almost unimpeachable. Like, you can, there are things I'm sure we could find to complain about, but why on earth would you? when everything on the plate here is so tasty um, <laughs> yeah it's got everything I want in a slasher film that is wrapped very beautifully around everything that I want in a sort of police uh, police procedural or murder mystery type drama and so it's like bacon wrapped shrimp it's like a, my favorite food wrapped <laughs> right. around another type of favorite food I love yeah yeah right like wh why on earth would you turn either of those things down and you put them together and it's it, like just an orgasmic uh, explosion of deliciousness. Um, right, maybe the chef dipped it in a little too much cumin, but I'm not going to complain because it's still bacon-wrapped shrimp. I'm going to shut the fuck up and eat it. Right. Oh, oh, it's a little salty. Shut up and eat your bacon-wrapped shrimp. Um, all right, so let's do... Ooh. Uh, let's do... I had a phone call. Um, let's do three things that you might not know about this year movie, Black Christmas. Awesome. Um, and we'll see if you have the one that I'm thinking of. Okay. So the role of Peter was originally not going to be Cure Julia. It was offered to Malcolm McDowell. Who, oh my God. How different would that have been? Yeah. Who turned it down for no other reason than he, than he didn't think the movie was going to be very good. And has stated since, of course, that he regrets not being in the movie because of not just be, because it was a hit which it was um, it made like six and a half times its budget something like that but uh, but just because of the cult status that it gained he was you know Malcolm McDowell never saw a cult movie he didn't want to be in uh, and it happened to be in a few on his own so uh, no complaints but yeah, yeah he fell backward into several for sure yeah for sure but uh, yeah, like I, again, one of those Gilda Radner things of like, 
man, this would have been such a different movie. Not not totally different, but it would have it, there would have been a different, you know, the cumin would have been different on this bacon wrapped shrimp if <laughs> right. it had been Malcolm McDowell instead of Kierdulia, but uh, who I think is great. So I don't like I'm not. It's not a better than situation, just different is all. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's do this one. Um, when it was initially released, this movie was going to be called. Uh, Silent Night, Evil Night because the American distributor thought the title Black Christmas made it sound like a black exploitation movie and they in fact released it under the title Silent Night, Evil Night and the movie kind of flopped and then they changed it back to Black Christmas and then it was a hit I did know that and uh, that actually is quite hilarious to me it's amazing how distributors always fuck that up um the trick that i love is they release a movie that didn't do well under one title and then they rename it to release it under a different title it's even more exploitative and if that one doesn't work they release it yet a third time under a different title uh yeah so at least they got it back to the original title and like i said earlier and i stand by this statement if bob clark says it's gonna work it will fucking work the man knows what he's doing yeah, knows how to make a movie. Everybody shut up and listen to Bob Clark, but I need that t-shirt. Um, so, the final one I will get to here is that the, the story goes, this was Elvis Presley's favorite horror movie ever. And he watched it uh, every movie, or every Christmas he could until his death in 1977. And his family has kept that tradition alive where like Priscilla and Lisa Marie and, and so forth, when they get together at Christmas, the movie that the Presleys watch is Black Christmas. I do believe that Lisa Marie actually did confirm that at one point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that is correct. So, um, yeah, I think that is a real thing that the the family of the king uh, sits down every Christmas and watches Black Christmas. And if that doesn't make you happy... I, I don't know what to do for you. Uh, well, I used to have a ritual where I would listen to Elvis's, like like the Christmas music that Elvis did while putting up and decorating my tree after watching Black Christmas so I could be a little closer to the king. Sure. I mean, I, I we were coming back from the, uh, uh, the Christmas tree lighting just the other night and some Elvis uh, branded Christmas music came on and had a, had a grand time with it. I like a little Elvis at Christmas time. Uh, if I remember correctly, and I don't want to give incorrect information here, so I want to just parse it with this is just how my memory goes. Uh, the confirmation that Lisa Marie did about this being uh, Elvis's favorite movie, she, I remember something about him owning a 16 millimeter print of it and that he would uh, screen the movie for the family on that 16, like they had a 16 millimeter projector that they had movies as a family with. And that was one of them that he had a copy of on 16. Huh. Uh, I was doing a quick scan, but I don't see that in particular. But I mean, that sounds I, totally. I, I totally like. I right. couldn't. I couldn't find it anywhere. But I remember, as I remember it, it was shortly after the split up between Michael Jackson and her, and then when she went with uh, Nicolas Cage, because it was that's how it went, right? It was Jackson and then mm -hmm. Cage. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it, it, there was like interviews with her and Nicolas Cage, which is where I became interested in this because uh, while I'm uh, just as much a Rage Cage fanatic as anybody else, I try to tinder my love of it down because I'm waiting for the day that he finally disappoints me. He hasn't yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember reading that interview and they were talking to both of them. And um, he, I, I think he was the one that kind of let it slip that that actually is true. And since she was there, she went ahead and confirmed it and kind of told, told the story. When that interview happened and where, I have no fucking clue, but that's how I remember it. If it's like a Mandela effect, Bernstein Bears kind of thing, I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes Apocrypha is just as good as facts. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, so what, uh, what other unknown facts those are the the three that i am going to put forward but uh please regale no, us the elvis one was the one that i actually was was holding in my back pocket because i mean i know it's on imdb and everything but the fact that it the, the fact that it was an interview con confirmation as far as i remembered it and i tried to find it but i could not within the short amount of time that i recalled it <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what we'll, we'll do one to grow on 
Ju just to cover our bases here, one other little known fact about Black Christmas. The composer, a guy named Carl Zittrer, um, and Bob Clark, to make the score for this movie, would, uh, it was all mostly composed on the piano, but then they would tie, like, forks and knives and shit to the piano wire so that it would make these weird hollow metallic sounds and that's that's how you get the score for black christmas sounds similar to uh what uh the beastie boys uh or not beastie boys but the beach boys actually did um with pet sounds yeah. right uh, he yeah. put uh bobby pins and stuff on the string so they would make these weird vibration noises yeah, and, and, and similarly to Pet Sounds, like when they were doing the uh, the audio track recording, they would put their fingers on the tape so that it slowed it some, so that when it was recording, it not only w was these weird discordant sounds, but then they were stretched out so that it became, you know, almost an, like an inhuman sound. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, uh, all the corners of this movie have a, a healthy dose of creativity uh attached to them so it's uh yeah that it, score is pretty close to what they did with texas chainsaw massacre really where it's discordant and with instruments that are not your usual thing to create sound yeah it's it's very good um well and that will do it for uh black christmas uh court man thanks oh, we for got we got one more thing. I never told you the other family story. I actually have one oh, more. Please. We never actually got to it when we were describing the film, but do you remember the sequence when everybody's out looking for the killer and the one cop comes back to the station with a buttload of buckshot? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pants around his ankles? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And they're like working on pulling the buckshot out for him. Okay, so um, this is a story that was confirmed to me by my great uncle. Okay. So I'm not going to give the actual family name because, spoiler alert, everybody, my real last name's not Psyops. So, but for the purposes of this story, it will be. Right? Okay. Okay. So my great, great grandfather Psyops owned an apple orchard and also a sawmill, like way, way back in the days, like, you know, first, second immigrant off the boat, maybe, you know, like really, really far back to settling where I grew up. And their sawmill kept having gas stolen from them, like, all the time. And they couldn't figure out what was happening or why. So my great-grandfather, Psyops, said, I'm going to spend the night at this location, and whoever shows up here is getting a buttload of buckshot. Mm -hmm. Told that to everybody that worked at the sawmill, all the family, everything like that, and he did exactly that. And he did exactly that. Somebody showed up, they were stealing their gas... He shot them in the ass with a bottle of buckshot as they were doing it to, to run them off. Uh, that guy actually ran off the person who got shot and later got caught when he went to the doctor. Now, the doctor basically was telling him, like, how did this happen? Did you get shot by accident? Were you hunting what was going on? And he said, no. And he tells the doctor, I went to the PSYOPs lumber yard. I was stealing gas. I did it over a couple of different nights. He caught me and he shot me in the ass. And the doctor looked him squared in the eye and said, I could have told you he would have done that. And That's then called the funny. cops on him. <laughs> I, but I, I, I really admire the fact that um, that he was like, oh, I'm definitely just going to come clean about this and, and not even bullshit and try to pretend that I did not bust into, you know. A lumber yard to steal the gas. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's an, it, this is an extremely small town in, like, you know, the very early days of development in the county that I grew up in that this took place in, where literally the doctor did know everybody because it was one doctor for everybody everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he knew, he knew my great-grandpa Psyops, and he knew that if someone got caught stealing his gas, they were going to get a buckload of buckshot. <laughs> they were going to get a shot in the ass because that's, I guess, apparently something that uh, was just the way to deal with it back then because you couldn't trust the cops out there in those days. So what the hell? That's how you handled it. But seeing that sequence where they're trying to, to pull that out, I thought of that story and how fucking much I was laughing with tears in my eyes when my Uncle Don was telling me because he's laughing his ass off because he's like, and then the old doc says, well, I could have told you PsyOps would have done that. That's awesome. I, that is a good family story of, <laughs> of 
Grandpa Psyops shooting somebody in the ass with Buckshot, that's quality. That's the <laughs> kind of family story you want. <laughs> it was like half Buckshot and half Rock Salt to really teach him a lesson. Oh, wow. <laughs> that I would hurt that like part. hell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Which is probably why he came clean with the doctor, because I think the doctor wouldn't have pulled it out till he told him the truth. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of Buckshot in the ass. <laughs> this, is, this has been, uh, a, a, you know, just as pleasurable, uh, if not quite as sudden. Um, but, uh, yeah, man. So, uh, by all means, pimp your wares. Where can people find more out of you? Because they're going to want to. The easiest place to locate me is the Legion Pat podcast. There's a main landing and launching page for us. Uh, it changed in recent years. I've been giving out the, or recent times, I don't know when, I've been giving out the somewhat incorrect address. What it is now is legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops dash podcast. Or you could just go to Legion Podcasts and click on the podcast link and subscribe to everything there. But on the way, make sure you hit cinema psyops, please. I need your attention. Sure. And sure. Affection. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you go to Legion Podcast, there's a, a tab that's just called the shows, and uh, you can find links to uh, Cinema Psyops uh, uh, there as well. So, um, man, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna let you go, and then I'm gonna close out the show uh, on the back end of this. But uh, that was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm so glad that I got to talk to you after this is not only the first time that you really seen Black Christmas, but also got to cover it and the the love and the joy that I was hoping would spring from you. Like I I had this secret hope because, you know, I didn't want it to be one of those like, oh, man, it's slow and boring. And I, I was suspected that you were going to love this. So that's why I jumped on it right away when you said uh, this one's still open. I'm like, I'll take it. <laughs> and I don't talk about it otherwise. So I think it's going to be a surprise for everybody to hear the love from both of us. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, you, you heard it here first, people. Or, or second or third, or maybe a thousandth. Doesn't matter. Go watch Black Christmas. All right. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be right back to close the show. Okay, there you have it. That is my conversation with Court about uh, Black Christmas, the 1974 original uh, as you heard, we both love this movie. It is so good. Oh my goodness, Black Christmas is so good, you guys. Uh, so thanks, as always, for listening. A little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, coming very soon to the Dark Parade. And by very soon, I mean uh, this here month of December. You are going to be getting a Heart of Horror with myself and Kate Pollock talking about Edward Scissorhands. You will be getting... Oh, by the way, speaking of that... Um, if you have any relationship stories or questions or comments or whatever, please go over to either the Facebook group for the Dark Parade or the Facebook group for Eternal Darkness of the Not-So-Spotless Mind and leave a, a comment or question. You can also message uh, me or Kate directly. You can hit me on Twitter as well at Dark Parade Pod. Um, you can privately message so that if you say, hey, I kind of want to tell you this story about whatever, but I don't want names used, then we certainly respect that and and enjoy getting that kind of feedback. So um, Heart of Horror yet to record. So if you're uh, listening to this, uh, don't be shy about shooting over a message. Um, and then uh, in addition to that Heart of Horror, you will be getting a What You Watching with Jamie and Bo towards uh, the end of the month and the last week i'm not sure i've got something in mind and i'm not sure if i'm if i'm gonna pull the trigger or not on a new bonus episode or a new bonus show rather uh that i wanted to make part of the dark parade it was one of the ideas i had when i started it and i just haven't had time to do it i might actually have time to do it so uh we shall see but at any rate uh that stuff is all coming soon as well as uh, conversations about Black Christmas, uh, the remake, and Black Christmas, the 2019 remake. So all of that is ahead this month on uh, The Dark Parade. Uh, thanks, as always, for listening. I really appreciate the reviews. Uh, Boover left us a, a really great review over on uh, iTunes. 
If you would do the same, that helps the visibility of the show uh, quite a bit. iTunes is still kind of the name of the game, even if you're not using uh, an iTunes app to listen to the show. Uh, if you head over there and leave us a, a rating and review, that's still super helpful, and I really appreciate it. So, um, that all said, I think that's going to conclude our filthy business this evening. Um, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks for sharing the show around, all that stuff. Uh, you guys are the absolute best. I'm so, so proud of this show and, and the, the interactions that we've had around it. Uh, and I look forward to a, a whole new year of more of it. So um, that is it for now until uh, a sinister Sunday right around the corner. Remember, 5 o'clock uh, central time on youtube.com forward slash Legion podcasts. Uh, join us over there. And that's what turns into Morbid Monday, the uh, audio version released the next day. So... Uh, we'll see you then, and have yourselves a, uh, a, a great rest of the week, and until I see you next time, thank you for joining the Dark Parade.